This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to the How to Run for Office podcast from My Campaign Coach. Thank you to Campaign Sidekick for supporting the podcast. And you can find out more about Campaign Sidekick at campaignsidekick.vote. Find out how their best in breed voter contact platform can revolutionize your campaign and help you win. Today we're talking about campaign intelligence and opposition research with the man responsible for recording back the internal vetting and research of all the staff, coalition members, endorsers, volunteer leaders, and even more on the Ted Cruz presidential campaign. John Lapp is a Chicago native, naturalized Texan, and graduate of the University of Dallas. He serves as the Chief Operating Officer of Intel's, with a Z, Operation Research and Strategy. In that capacity, John leverages years of experience with campaigns of every level to craft winning narratives for candidates and the opposition research solutions necessary to ensure their success. The importance of their mission is embodied by a very powerful quote from George Washington. There is nothing more necessary than good intelligence to frustrate a designing enemy and nothing that requires greater pains to obtain. Prior to joining Intel's, John was the Assistant Executive Director of Open the Books, a national government transparency organization that focuses on exposing waste, fraud, and abuse by government units and agencies of all levels. John currently lives in Dallas, Texas with his bride, Fiona, and daughter, Nora. John, welcome to the podcast. Raz, thank you for having me. Great to be on. Absolutely. Uh, Got got to warn you, your uh, How to Run for Office uh, podcast might need to be renamed after this. I might scare some people off as the op researcher. Well, I tell you what, one of my, you know, back in my former life when I was helping a lot with candidate identification recruitment, one of the first things I did every time I sat down with somebody is really try to scare them out of running because there's a lot of stuff folks need to be understanding of and really have to wrap their heads around to jump in the ring because once they're in, you want to know that they're going to fight for it. And I like to make sure folks go in with both eyes wide open. So, Hopefully it won't scare everybody off, but it'll make sure everybody has a healthy understanding of what they got to do and what they got to be prepared for. Absolutely. It's a lot to be prepared for. I think if, uh, if you want to know what it's like, just watch Jeff Sessions' confirmation series and oh, man. You, you will say what they will do to your record. They, they definitely did a lot of twisting and lying throughout that whole proceedings. That was... Uh, yeah, a lot of those confirmation hearings I watch and I absolutely cringe. I, I, I would not want to be that guy. I don't want to be a cabinet secretary that bad. You, you couldn't pay me enough for it. But uh, I'm very thankful that there are folks, especially good folks like Sessions, that are willing to, to go through that hell in order to, to help give us some good guys in there. So let's start off by kind of talking about your story. What's your background? How did you get interested in politics? And what made you decide to take on this crazy line of work as a profession? Uh, well, uh, I will try and keep this positive and upbeat, but given what I do, that will be tough. Uh, just got off the phone with a, a longtime client who reminded me that I'm the most cynical person he's ever met. Um, (laughs) nobody can say that they're jaded after listening to this podcast episode. (laughs) No. So, uh, uh, before getting into a little bit of my background, just a little bit on, on op researchers in general, because I think. Uh, people might have a misunderstanding of what it is that we do and um, and what kind of people we are because uh, you're you know, bad this, people. The, the, this is not um, op research is not working at CTU. I think some clients <laughs> ex- expect that you know since the internet exists, everything must be right there, <laughs> all in one magical unified uh, database that Jack Bauer can hack into in no time. Exactly. So you know. Yeah, um, the internet is there and it's helpful, but we we can't pull up a building schematic in 30 seconds for, (laughs) you know, to advance an event or something. Um, uh, We're not private investigators. I think I think private investigators and lawyers make terrible op researchers. One private investigators, you know, bill like it's it's Chinatown and it's it's hourly, um, and you run into a mess there with a campaign, but. Uh, that and lawyers have a completely different standard of uh, what constitutes proof. And uh, although it's a higher standard, it's not really relevant to the court of public opinion. So um, when a lawyer or private investigator is is gathering facts, they're not really setting out to prove 
you know, what you and I understand as, you know, trying to disconnect a candidate from the voting public, uh, they are, you know, litigating in their mind how something would play out in court. And that's really not the world we play in. Um, you know, facts are important, but they can be massaged. <laughs> yep. We've seen plenty of examples of that. So uh, getting back to answering your very basic question, uh, I grew up in a very political household. Uh, we didn't need to listen to Rush Limbaugh because we had my dad. Um, <laughs> so that was always fun and, uh, you know, was involved by choice or not in local politics, you know, going to candidates fundraisers and family members were running for office. Nobody ever won. Uh, some of them ran as Democrats. So if anyone's ever doing research on me, you know, that's out there. Well, um, you're kind of in Chicago, <laughs> which has to be its own crazy nest. I mean, how, how was growing up in Chicago as a Republican trying to be involved politically? Well, you had to pay your tithe to the daily family. That was just expected of you. Right. So those, those donations that seem like they're in my name, that is not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no matter what the records say, that was not me guys. Uh, but yeah, Chicago is definitely an interesting town. Um, uh, as Texas is unique. So is Chicago, every place has their own, has their own brand of politics, but Chicago is certainly world famous, uh, for better or for worse. I think we know which one it is. <laughs> yeah, um, it's usually worse. <laughs> well, yeah, was always involved in politics. Um, where I really got my start and what led me to doing this was, uh, as you mentioned, working for Open the Books, which originally started as an organization called For the Good of Illinois. And this was a group started by uh, a guy who ran for governor of Illinois on a platform of government transparency, because if it's needed anywhere, it's certainly needed in Illinois and yeah. Chicago. Um, so his, his, uh, major platform point was putting every dime of government spending online in real time. So the public could just search and, you know, make their own determination on what was wasteful and what should be questioned and basically giving the public a tool to investigate their government. Uh, and it makes perfect sense that that's the way it should be. You know, yeah, you just, should just basically put your checkbook online, right? Right. You know, it should not require a request or going to a city council meeting. It's, you, you know, you can pick, pull up your checking account online anytime you want. Why can't the government just post theirs? And, you know, if there's any question about government spending or waste, it's all right there. And, uh, you know, the public can make their own determination. So that, uh, starting in Illinois, uh, expanded to a national basis, uh, and it was renamed Open the Books, um, because these stories are everywhere and you know you talk about government waste it's not it's not in washington it's right in your own backyard you know the highway commissioner who's who's responsible for a quarter mile of highway uh, <laughs> is not a good use of government money but uh, so i was an intern with them uh for most of college uh on my summer breaks and after graduating from the University of Dallas, I uh, went to work for them and uh, worked as the assistant executive director there, um, helping build the organization and uh, filing thousands and thousands of Freedom of Information Act requests. Riveting work, I'm sure. Which, which was a great segue into uh, opposition research because that that is the basis for a lot of it, which is getting information from public bodies uh, about budgets, uh, communications between elected officials, and, and seeing all that and how records are maintained in government, which is very unique and arcane, um, uh, proved to be very valuable as I started doing opposition research. Um, so that's kind of how I got into it personally. Um, but as a firm, uh, we were started by Mark Campbell, who, as you know, was national political director on the Cruz campaign. And he started Intel's um, a few years back because as a longtime general consultant, 
he was always extremely dissatisfied with the opposition research that he was given by researchers and wound up having to do most of it himself as the GC because the researcher just didn't really understand, you know, how the campaign was going to work. And, you know, you might have all this great information, but none of it's very useful. You need to put it in such a way that the pollster and the media consultant and the mail guy and the digital guy and the GC can actually use it in the campaign. And that's really the idea about Intel's is taking actual campaign operatives and doing the op research in a way that the campaign can use. Because you, what you don't want and what a lot of op researchers do is they hand over a 500 page report that has a lot of facts and guess what? I think you know a lot of GCs and the GC is not reading that. They're just going to say, is there anything here I can use? Yeah. So <laughs> that's what we're giving you. What so, you can so use. really you guys, you know, from y'all's background of understanding what was needed from campaigns, you, you go out there and so you look with it through that lens, you, you go through the data and search for stuff that, that you know is usable. And then you, you, you work to present that to campaigns. You communicate that in a special way that allows them to know what and ha- what information they can use and how it could be deployed. Is, is that kind of what you guys try to do? Absolutely. You have to uh, synthesize things in such a way that, you know, you can take our research reports and lift it directly into the direct mail. Right. Yeah, you there's, need those there's, bullet there's, points. There's, there's no translation required to talk to a voter uh, in a very direct way. And we're not talking about dumbing something down. You just need to be concise and clear and very clearly defined what the issue is. Because you can talk about all the times that somebody voted to raise taxes, but you need to def- specifically define that disconnect and perhaps contrast it with something in their record. And then you actually have something that you can use in the campaign. Well, and it's, I think that synthesize is the perfect word there because you're not just looking for a single data point, right? You're looking at a, at a constellation and you have to you know, connect those dots in such a way you know, those different, those quotes that they've made, the votes they've had, and the resulting expenditures in, in this scenario I'm thinking about. You have to be able to connect those and then synthesize that into a bullet point, a talking point that they can, the campaign can use and say, this is what exemplifies this candidate. You're trying to define them, right? Absolutely. I mean, campaigns come down to message and math, as you know. And the message, and unless you are telling a story, you're losing because people are connecting with a story and a narrative and a message. If you just give them a fact about spending, they they, they don't really care. I mean. <laughs> and I feel conservatives are possibly the worst at that because oftentimes we think that, hey, you know, our, our principled stance, that should stand alone. We shouldn't have to explain it. We shouldn't have to really work hard to communicate it. We're gonna lower taxes. We're gonna protect the country. We're gonna save babies. We're, we're these, these kind of things. But that in and of itself, that's not a story. That's not how you communicate to voters. And so you guys try to help make that communication more possible through your research, through how you present that. Absolutely. Uh, What we like to say a lot is that facts don't speak for themselves. Absolutely right. And that's, I think most people would agree with you when they hear that. But if you look at the actions of a lot of campaigns, it, you know, it makes them liars that they don't actually act like that when on the campaign trail. So at what point in, you know, working, going through college, I mean, we're in this, in this time frame. did you decide politics is something that I want to be involved with? This is a, this is the kind of thing I want to be involved with with as far as a profession. Uh, I am sure you get this answer a lot with people you interview who are in politics, but I could not imagine doing anything else. Um, I'm right with you. You This this is is our world. Uh, We did not choose it. It shows us. (laughs) Uh, and sometimes we scream out to the gods and say, why, why? <laughs> you know, when it's 3 a.m. and apparently something has to be done by 6 a.m., uh, you know, those moments make you wonder why you're doing what you're doing. But it is, well, uh, let's call it a no- noble calling for lack of a better term. Yeah, or, or a drug we can't get away from. It depends on the day, maybe. But I, I definitely can understand that. It's it's been a It's been a passion, kind of a calling that I've been involved with for a long time. So I... I can appreciate that. I, I don't remember one point myself, but it's just kind of been a continual string of getting sucked into it on different levels. So let's uh, let's shift over a little bit to kind of how you guys operate as a company. So 
you've talked a little bit about what Intel's do does. You guys do both you know, campaign strategy and uh, research, but you also do work on the corporate side as well, right? Sure. Yeah. So uh, about half our work is corporate, and uh, you know what we try to do there is uh, use political tactics and research methods and uh, communication strategies in the corporate world. Um, it is somewhat surprising. Uh, corporate decision making uh, in politics, you know, it's a no brainer that you would do opposition research on somebody. Uh, whether you do it well or not is, you know, up to who you hire. But in the corporate world, it's corporations play hardball, but it's surprising that they miss a lot of due diligence opportunities. Um, you know, when you when you start a campaign, it's obvious that you're going to do opposition research on somebody. But if you are a corporation moving into a new market, um, what you investigate with your competition might not be at the level uh, that would be beneficial to your operations. So, you know, it it's no problem for us to you know give a complete uh, dossier on uh, a board of directors for a, a competitor competitor's firm um, to better inform decision making by a company, but it's not something that they normally do for for whatever reason. I don't know, but I think everyone should operate as if uh, they're in a campaign because life is a campaign, and somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. <laughs> So when you're looking back, especially on the campaign side, what as a firm does y'all's working relationship look like with the client? So I'm I'm running a, a U.S. Senate campaign and I'm calling you say, hey, I need some help. What uh, I don't know necessarily what I'm looking for, what I need. What are you guys going to do to help make sure that I'm positioned and have the needed information to, to win? Well, we are blessed that uh, most of the time we are brought into races by uh, other consultants who have worked with us in the past and know that we do good research and that we're going to give the whole team what they need to win. Um, it, it is uh, somewhat rare that we'll work directly with the campaign. Um, uh, it's typically, you know, the GC who will bring us into a race because uh, they know if they've got us, then, then they don't need to do it themselves. Um, but the, it's been surprising that a lot of candidates um, also have a misconception about what it is that we do. And I'm sure a lot of candidates have misconception about a lot of areas of how campaigns run. Um, yep, that's part of what we're trying to fix here <laughs> on the podcast. Right. So, um, you know, when, when we're introduced as the research team, uh, you know, on a conference call or, or whatever it is, a lot of times it's like, you know, are we allowed to be talking to this person? Like, aren't they the shady guy, like handing you the manila folder in an alley? <laughs> it's and, always in a parking garage. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I think, you know, we're pretty professional and legit. We use Google drive and <laughs> all the modern conveniences. Right. Um, uh, but when we are when we are working with a client, it's it's good to have that uh, that buffer of an experienced campaign team uh, between us and the candidate, because if it's a first time candidate, um, let's break it up this way: we'll do a vulnerability study before they want to run for office, or as they're considering it, and then the opposition research on their opponents. In the vulnerability study phase, it is amazing when you talk to the candidate directly their ability to try and explain away everything it is that you found and this is a very important lesson that I want to make sure your listeners take note of in politics if you are explaining you are losing 100% it, if something can be explained away in one sentence and people are satisfied with that that's one thing but when you get to sentence two and three, that is dangerous territory. <laughs> They've stopped listening. 
And the point of a vulnerability study is to get to that one sentence and eliminate sentence two and three, where you're talking about, oh, it, it was a subcommittee vote, but it wasn't recorded, and you know this is actually all okay. No, it's not. <laughs> the public doesn't care about the subcommittee vote that wasn't recorded. They care about what the record shows. And so part of what you guys got to do is, is one, there's an education that the GC has to do about the value there. And you guys didn't have to go in and, and basically say, look, we're not here to judge you. We're here to help you get that down to that one sentence answer, help you synthesize all the information we found and basically helping kind of where we're in the black hats in this situation. And we're here to pressure you, put you under the microscope and say, how do you explain this? Okay, that's not good enough. Do it again. Let's cut it down. This is the right way. We got to work towards that concise answer that alleviates the concerns of the voter. Absolutely. Uh, another one of the things that we don't do that some clients think we do, uh, we can't change the fact that you made a bad decision a while back and that there is <laughs> evidence of it. Um, I, I, I can't call the court and tell them to expunge something. Uh, you can't break it and just delete that? What? That's just not how life works, unfortunately. Okay, so Intel's does not have a way back machine. That's right now, disappointing. But in, in candidate world, there are all sorts of tricks. Yeah, that's that's true. So when you're when you're working with that client, what is uh, you know? So you do the vulnerability study. What comes next? Uh, so uh, we like to do the vulnerability study. Uh, first <laughs> if, of all. if they let you, if they bring you in in time. Right. Uh, but you know, sometimes things get started late, and that's a campaign. But it is what it is. Um, so ideally, you know, we do the vulnerability study and there's plenty of time to do that. There's plenty of time to discuss it. Um, you know, there's multiple calls with the whole team along the way. Um, what we like to do is not start with an interview with the candidate because um, we don't want to be tainted by their perception of reality. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we'll go do our first pass and then confront them with that and, uh, and, and see how, how their narrative matches up. Um, and then along the way, you know, we're looking for other things. Um, and eventually, like you said, we want to get to that point where the team can sit down uh, with a concise document and say, okay, this is what's coming. You know, there's no way to delete it, but we can respond to this. It's going to be okay. We just need to have a clear and concise and consistent message. Um, you know, the campaign needs to speak with a unified vo voice, and this is the time to come up with it. Um, and then from the vulnerability study, you know, as a field takes shape, we'll, uh, we'll do the op research on, on all the candidates or maybe just the top few that are really real contenders. Um, and from there, the, the campaign uh, gets, um, you know, to inform their decision making better. Um, the pollster will have something that they can actually test. Um, I, I'm sure you'll you'll do a podcast uh, about polling if you haven't already. And yeah, we're gonna, I think we're gonna have Chris Perkins on sometime soon. I know you know right. him from the Cruz campaign. Well, Chris can tell you, you know, they're not the ones doing the research. You know, at every other campaign vendor is going to tell you we're not the ones doing the research <laughs> right nobody likes doing that research <laughs> and we love it and we think we're pretty good at it, so um so as i understand it part of the value of you guys having that tight knit relationship with the gc is that a lot of your communication a lot of that that candid feedback the candidate is not really going to be in the best place to hear that a lot of times because especially during the vulnerability study you guys are, are cutting them to pieces right and that's Absolutely. that's your job your job is to say what's the worst we can find and how is the worst way we can spin that against the campaign? You're supposed to give them a feel for what a worst case scenario from an opposition campaign is going to be. And so, you know, if you come to me as a candidate and you're cutting me to pieces, I'm probably going to be like, what the heck am I paying these guys for? They're supposed to be on my team. But the oh. GC, because they've done it before, they understand the value and can help kind of coach the candidate to be understanding of the value you guys provide, right? And the value that research gives. Right. No, uh, it's... It, it's been surprising over the years that uh, the vulnerability studies call, vulnerability study calls are not as uh, as hostile or uncomfortable as you think they might be. Um, I, I th 
I think if we were trying to convince a candidate that they needed to do a vulnerability study, that would be a tough spot. But if the if the good experience GC has gotten them to the point where, listen, these guys know what they're doing, um, you just need need to be honest with them because they're going to find it anyway. Um, then from there, it's usually a pretty pretty productive relationship. But um, you know, like I said before, this is not CTU. Well, this is also not House of Cards. We're not sitting down with anybody, you know, in a dark basement room asking them about weird experiences at summer camp in seventh grade. Um, <laughs> no, you're I disappointing just, I, everybody listening to this podcast right now, John. I, <laughs> I really just want to know about your financial disclosures and offshore accounts, and you know, the beach house in Mexico that you somehow forgot to disclose. Um, so it's it's not very sexy. <laughs> So t- tell me about what's your biggest client pet peeve? Because I know you've got to have a several, but what are your, your top one or top couple? Things that somebody should not do when they call you and they have you working for them. All right. You're probably going to have to cut down this segment a bit because I could go on for 20 minutes. <laughs> it's but probably my, worth that time. My biggest client pet peeve uh, would be, let's go like top five. I'll just start rambling let's do it. off. So it is not just clients, but unfortunately sometimes uh, uh, other campaign professionals that we work with about how, how data and information is housed and maintained. So let me introduce that this way. You talk about the Russians supposedly hacking the U.S. election. Okay, well, if they wanted to do that, there's no centralized voting database. It's thousands of county clerk systems across the country. And court records and other things like that are the same way. They're, you can't do like a national court system search it, because there's no national court system. At the federal level, you've got everything and it's nicely housed and the system's great because they've got a bunch of money to create that system. But, you know, a county in uh, the middle of nowhere, Texas, of which there are a lot, it might not even have a website. <laughs> so the court definitely doesn't have a website. Yeah, and, I, I, I'll tell you, I deal with a lot of election data and just you know, getting voter files and voting histories and all like that. And the num- you know, we have 254 counties here in Texas. That's a lot. And a lot of them are very small with hardly any infrastructure on the county level as far as technology and databasing. And every county does it differently. And there right. is no, I mean, and most of these people are trying to send me PDF files. They're not Excel. It's not database. It's, it's all basically old hard copies. And I know it's the same when you talk about going, you know, some of this in, probably involves going to these small counties and actually going paper records. That's where a lot of them still have it. Right. So, you know, it'll be on paper and, uh, oh, it's in archives and, oh, it's a microfilm. Okay, I'm 26 years old. I should not know what microfilm is. It shouldn't exist. It should be wiped from the face of the earth. Oh, my gosh. But apparently every county thinks that's the most efficient way to keep things. So guess what? It's on a microfilm machine. It's in the basement. Um, the archives are locked, and only Susie has the key, and she's only here on Tuesdays, but it's her Tuesday off. Okay. So oh, wow. I have to go back and tell the candidate that, you know, okay, it's going to be another week. Well, I thought you said it was online. It's, no, it's not. <laughs> and you might run into a situation in a county where, uh, you know, everything for the circuit court is online and available, but the district court is an entirely different story. And I I wrote down this quote because I wanted to make sure I worked it in, but I was talking to a county clerk in Oklahoma uh, on behalf of a campaign trying to get a court record and was told that she could fax it, but the county doesn't allow them to send long-distance faxes. So let's just dissect that for a second. (laughs) If I were in a position to receive a local fax, I could just come pick it up. Secondly, I have no idea what a long distance fax is. When did long distance become a thing again? I thought that died 20 years ago. So when dealing with a government agency and trying to get information, 
if you are friendly, it is going to work out well. There's no reason to be hostile. It might not make any sense, but you just need to know that you're playing in their court. This is like the uh, the John Adams miniseries on HBO. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Oh, I love it. He's appointed to the Court of St. James as ambassador for the United States, and he's being briefed on how to approach King George. You are to enter the room and give three reverences, once upon entering, once halfway up, and when you are in the royal presence. That is how you deal with Betty Lou <laughs> at the county clerk's office. Oh, it's perfect. Oh, and I'll tell you, that is no joke. Absolutely not a joke. And they're, I mean, they're usually nice people, but, yeah. you know, whether or not they help you, it will eventually be five o'clock. So they've got no reason to help you. Yep, I've dealt with a lot of Betty Lou's. They're nearly universally amazing people and hardworking, yeah. but it, it's it's just a fact of working yeah. with government functionaries, really in general. Yeah, I mean they have you know their normal workflow, and it involves people coming into the office and dealing directly to with them. But they they're not getting calls from people like me every day that you know I'm five states away, but I need this today and it's very important. Um, it just doesn't happen, so you just, you know, you got to work with them. And and then, it, it, you know, uh, they can't fax something, but uh, if you send them a money order, they can they can email it to you. <laughs> like, You're like, where the heck do I get a money order? Can I give you a credit card? Oh, yeah, so it does, doesn't it, always work that way. It's fun, but um, every, every system is different, I guess is the point. And, you know, knowing how to navigate those systems is, is, is most of of this game. What other, uh, what are the big pet peeves you got? You get clients who do not care about their vulnerability study and they will confront real issues, uh, and just completely dismiss them when, um, you know, you and I as campaign people know exactly, uh, where the other campaign is going to go and it's right there and it's going to hurt. But uh, people can justify the things that they've done, and it's it's usually small stuff that they'll dismiss, uh, like uh, being a late on, late on a tax payment. Uh, you know, oh, I was late, but I paid it. Okay, well, that's not the point. You are asking voters to trust you in making the rules, but you couldn't follow them yourself. You know, that's the point. But. When, when we look at ourselves, we see things differently. That's a fact. And especially, I think, when you're running for office, because you don't run for office unless you've got an ego, whether that's good or bad. You, you're going to have to have one because you've got to believe that you're the one person that could do the best job at this role. And you obviously don't think you're a bad person because you're you and you have your record and you think there's perfectly fine justification for that. Either it's, oh, I made a stupid decision, it was a one-off, or yeah, there's no pattern here. But right. You know, it's it's when they're not gonna they're not gonna listen to you and say this is a this is a serious issue. You got to have a response to it. And then on the flip side, uh, so they don't care about the things that they should, but uh, you know when a candidate when it's when it's October and things are close, you get the most bizarre requests, and it always comes directly from the candidate who's backed into a corner and. Normally, you just have to ignore the email, you know, because no good can come from, uh, you know, f fulfilling what they've asked you to do. Well, I'd imagine a lot of that comes, they're asking for stuff on the other guy that if you presented it to them as stuff they did wrong on your vulnerability study, they would have said, oh, that's not a, that's not a big deal. That, that's not a, not a pattern. There's a one off. Right. So uh, without naming any names, uh, out of respect for our clients, confidentiality, of course, um, uh, it was two weeks out from the election and a client asked, uh, we need to get so-and-so's the sign in sheets from his daughter's school so that we can prove he's a bad father. Oh my gosh. Delete. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 
People get yeah. desperate. People, good people you know get very desperate. Yeah, we, we, we probably could have gotten it, you know, just as a point of pride for what we're <laughs> capable of doing. But, it, you know, it makes no sense what you're going to do with it. And I'm trying to understand why this would matter to the voters. But, okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. People ask for some crazy stuff. I, I, and I can only imagine there's even crazier stuff that, that you've got you can't talk about. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try and top that story. Okay, go uh, for it. And perhaps this will have to be edited out as well. But <laughs> another client who shall, be, who shall remain nameless was running for a uh, high office. Um, not the highest. I want to clarify that. <laughs> and That narrows uh, it down for, away upon, from one. That's good. Upon going through the vulnerability study with this client, um, which had some uh, standard issues, you know, the business was not maintained properly as far as records go and taxes and, and all that. Uh, this person did not seem to care about any of those legitimate issues and said something along the lines of, um, well, there's nothing in here about um, my cousins out east who are liberals and drug addicts, and I think one of them had to terminate a pregnancy. It's like, um, I'm not sure if you know, you know, how it is we get our information, but, you know, we're not going and talking to all your relatives and trying to dig up dirt that way. You know, this is, <laughs> this has no relevance to your candidacy whatsoever. Um, and if this is, this is how you think uh, a campaign goes, I, you need, you need to really work on defining your message. Yeah. They're watching a little bit too much of the house of cards. Right. Wow. Let's shift over the cruise campaign. So Intel's is hired to do the vetting of coalition members, endorsers, staff, volunteer leaders, et cetera. Basically anybody that came in contact with the campaign, you through Intel's was, was in charge of that because Mark, the, 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 the main the, the main guy, the founder of Intel's, he was actually on the inside as an inside of the campaign as the national political director. So you run right. the shop at Intel's and you got a big amount of, of largely internal vetting, right? That's right. So uh, I primarily worked, uh, my contacts were the regional political directors um, who I would work with on the vetting. Um, and if need be, they would report back to Mark on, uh, you know, on major issues. So talk a little bit about uh, about the importance of of that part because I think a lot of people uh, obviously it's it's I imagine it would primarily be larger campaigns have a larger budget and have more people that need to vet but talk about the importance of vetting those those people close to you that you're that are supporting your campaign and why you guys were hired to do that role. Uh, so I think that was tremendously important and um, I don't know if if other campaigns all did it. Um, it was certainly an investment with us. Uh, and a very time-consuming process. Um, you know, every every time there was an event or a bus tour um, or a list of endorsements rolled out or coalitions, um, you know, if someone was standing on stage with the senator, uh, that person would need to be vetted. Um, but even beyond that, you know, the manager of the venue. Uh, is this person, you know... A Democrat in disguise, and they're going to want to cause a problem. Um, who have they given money to? What are they posting on social media? Um, I think Jimmy Kimmel learned that who you bring to the Oscars is going to be an issue. Yep. Uh, was that him? Uh, it sounds <laughs> right. <laughs> I, 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 I watched. Watch I, I don't watch the Oscars either, but I think I, I saw something about something about that on one of the headlines on Twitter or something. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, you are judged by the company you keep, even if it's uh, just the guy who introduced you. And all that matters, and it all creates uh, the narrative of the events or the uh, coalition press release. So, you know, you can't have uh, a list of 30 people uh, released on your letterhead and have one of those people be an issue because then that's the whole story. Well, you know, there are a lot of situations, you know, going, kind of going back to what you said earlier, if you're explaining, you're losing. And we saw multiple times throughout the campaign, uh, I'm sure it happened with Trump, I know it happened with Hillary, where the story became, why is that person standing behind you? 
like I, so I think at some one of Hillary's rallies, a relative, like the father of the guy that shot up Orlando, the nightclub in Orlando, was like on the stage or was in the yeah. crowd, and that became the story. It was not about what she was saying, which I, I think was terrible, <laughs> I assume, <laughs> but that was the story. And so, as a candidate, if it's coming, if your message you're trying to get out, you've honed that, you've really worked hard to make that the message you're communicating across, making sure that the voters are hearing what you want them to. And when the story becomes about the guy sitting off, you know, that's circled in the background on the, on the picture, if he's the story, then you're losing big time. Not only did you fail to communicate your message, but you've totally been hijacked. Right. And uh, our modern political discourse, if you can call it that, is set up perfectly uh, to create these kinds of situations. Because somebody snaps the photo and everyone's a reporter and it gets tweeted. It's on BuzzFeed and there goes your day <laughs> <laughs> or your week. I mean, it, it can, you know, we've seen that, you know, we saw it on the cruise campaign. We saw it from other campaigns, pretty much every other one. At some point, somebody got hijacked because of something internal. It wasn't mm-hmm. always the opposition making the, you know, starting the fires. It was sometimes the internal stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, anyone, anyone who got near the campaign, including, uh, the Santas that were hired for the, the SEC area uh, Christmas tour, they were all vetted. So if any reporter talked to them and, and got the name, there would be no issues. You've literally vetted Santa. That's, that's pretty awesome. I think I vetted uh, several thousand people, and it was an honor to be a part of that campaign. That's fantastic. Well, I know, you know during that time I was on the Super PAC side supporting Ted's campaign and, you know, we did a lot of, of joint events and you know, it's just from the event side, it was a huge, uh, it was a weight off of, off of my shoulders when I'm helping run an event. When I know that the people that are coming up there have been vetted, that they're good operators, that we know the caliber of the people and that they're not going to be an embarrassment on or off stage. And that, that's something that I don't know. Like I said, I don't know if other campaigns did that. I'm sure some did to, to some degree, but the level you guys went to, to protect from those kind of hidden liabilities is huge because, you know, throughout the campaign, there were a ton of people that wanted to be associated. It was a, it was a badge of honor for them to be part of the team, to be on a, a leadership committee, to be on a coalition committee, whatever it might've been, or a volunteer leader. That was, that was a big deal for them and it, as it should have been, but there were people that were involved that I know had stuff that, uh, you know, excluded them from that possibility. Oh yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're given a title by the campaign as director of this or leader of this or coordinator, you've just become a liability. So clean up the Facebook and represent the campaign. Well, I love it. So is there anything else as far as how that kind of thing, you know, whether it's the cruise campaign or, or others, you know, is there anything else you want to talk about as far as how that works or, or the, really the importance of, of what that process does for the campaign? Uh, well, I think uh, what I would like potential candidates to know is that, you know, opposition research is not a nice add-on to a campaign. It's a foundational element. Um, if you're going to poll, they're going to need something to test. If you plan on doing any uh, voter contact with mail or TV, they're going to need something to say. Uh, so, you know, it's not an add-on. It's where you should start. Uh, I think that's the most important important thing people need to understand. Obviously, you know, I'm self-interested. I will say this is the most important element of a campaign, but uh, it really is because n- no one else is going to do it. I guarantee it. Now, that's that's a fact. <laughs> Well, and, and one of the, yeah, it, it's usually you know in the movies or on House of Cards or something that somebody's handing the candidate or the campaign manager a, a Manila envelope full of all this dirt, and they're like, uh, "Do you want it?" And they're like, "Oh no," or "I'll stick in the drawer." But the truth is, this is not some kind of shady back alley or you know uh, <laughs> parking garage type exchange. This is you need to know what's out there from a vulnerability perspective. You have to know what's out there on you, otherwise you can't protect yourself. And you have to know what's out there on your opponents because that's going to inform what you think about what they might do and how they might react and what leverage they could have. I mean, it's, it's incredibly consequential. Absolutely. I, it is, it is not back alley at all. It is an essential component of a modern 
professional campaign. Well, and I I also think that one of the major misconceptions is that opposition research is there to help you really change who somebody is or do something fishy about remaking this person. And the fact is, that's not what it is, right? It's you're helping them build their message. You're not there to, you you work with good conservative people and your goal is not to say, oh, this was, you know, this bad thing you did was good or what. You're there to say, this is what's out there. We're working for you to help you understand how voters will perceive this. And if you're the right guy for this, then you need to be able to understand that you may have to answer for this at some point, whether it's good or bad or whether it's explicable or not. That's exactly right. Um, you know, that that bombshell fact uh, is so very rare uh, in what we find just just by the nature of things. People people are not as bad as you think. They, they slip up, but, you know, not everyone is an axe murderer. Some are. They choose not to run for office for some reason. But um, when you do, there's another point to this, and that if you have so much bad stuff on somebody, you have to be very careful in how you use it. Because if you run with it all at once, the opponent can say, and this happened, uh, not in one of our racers, it's a very simple response. If any of this were true, would I be running for office? And then you're done. So, <laughs> well, and you know, we, we saw a, a slightly different type of example as Trump was running, la- you know, this last year, right? It was a it was a different thing where there was a ton of stuff out there about him, and he somehow explained it away, right? He basically right. just ignored it in large part, or he just took it as a badge of honor and said, all the, all those things I said, I've, I've changed. And normally that doesn't work for Trump. It did, but, and I think it's surprised. It definitely surprised me, but I am, I am so excited uh, for the upcoming cycle because you will have lots of candidates who believe that the game has changed and that Donald Trump proved Oh, nothing. None of that matters. Yeah, record, and the things I, you said, things you did. Bring yeah. it on. Yeah. Can't wait. It's It's been interesting, you know, I'm sure you've had a lot of these conversations. People, you know, the, the cons, quote-unquote consulting class, people that are political operatives and, and candidates, a lot of people are, you're trying to decide, hey, has, has Trump's election, has that broken the mold or changed the game? And in some ways, maybe it has, but in large part, I still think that the, some of these things like you're talking about that's it's kind of a one-off. It is a special case, and I think you're spot on. There'll be a lot of candidates that are all of a sudden going to think my record doesn't matter, the things I've said or may have done, all that stuff. I can just say, ah, oh, fake news, uh, mainstream media, yada yada. I've changed, and that's going to be different. But I don't think it is. Yeah, I don't think a lot of other people uh, running for office have spent 30 years and several billion dollars defining their brand. Um, so that's why it's not going to work for them. I 100% agree. Now, one of the one of the things that I I imagine you find some frustration with, and we obviously see in the news sometimes, is you, know, you present this research, this vulnerability study to candidates. They have serious vulnerabilities, and either because of them or the campaign manager, there's a decision made. It's like, you know what? That's not going to come out, or we're not going to deal with that. Uh, the the best example that comes to mind for me is uh, George W. Bush's DWI or DUI back in the day. You know they didn't address that. They thought early on about you know pushing that out right out of the gate and explaining it, getting it out of the way, and disarming that bomb before it could go off or the the opposite. You know Gore's campaign could. They didn't, and so all of a sudden late in the election, that's getting dropped, and they're they're losing weeks of the campaign trying to explain that, and uh, you know and, and it. It could have cost them the election. It definitely you know, hurt them significantly during that fall. How do you deal with that with campaigns, or is that even part of what you guys do? Do you, do you help with explaining why they, they really need to get out in front of this, or is that something you hand that off to the GC and, and let them worry about? Uh, so somewhat, somewhat related to your question, but I think it still answers it. <laughs> Good. Go for it. One of the first races I was on was a state rep race in Illinois, And we had a lot of bad things on our opponent. And our candidate was extremely gracious. This was, you know, a somewhat local race, a small state rep district. Invited the opponent to coffee, told him about all this, told him it's going to be very unpleasant. 
don't want to do this, but it's going to happen. And, you know, suggested he might want to reconsider running. He, uh, you know, stuck to his guns and uh, stayed in the race. It all came out. Um, at every point where he had the opportunity to come clean, the story changed. It wasn't accurate. He was leaving pieces out. And, um, you know, unfortunately, he made the decision to stay in the race. And uh, he was a public school teacher. And he is no longer a public school teacher because he lied on his application uh, about oh, his wow. arrest record. So, you know, elections have consequences, and it's not just in the political arena. Um, you know, people's lives can change if they choose to do stupid things and lie about them. Uh, but he was given every opportunity to bow out and chose not to. So, you know, that was that was one of my first uh, races as the researcher, and that individual delivered a pizza to my parents' house a few months ago. So. Oh my gosh! Wow, that's uh, that's that's Just pretty crazy. Making the world a better place. <laughs> One pizza delivery guy at a time. Wow, that's pretty wild. Now, so stepping back away from specifically, uh, you know, from specifically the Cruz campaign or the, the the research side, when you're analyzing campaign, either one you're working you know, as a vendor for, or you know, just as your you know you you just as a hobby, this is, this is something you're addicted to as much as I am. When you're looking at campaigns, what are some of the things that you look for? The kind of the top attributes you look for as you're trying to analyze the the health of that campaign, whether they're doing a good job, bad job, on the ropes or not? Uh, well, we like to work with uh, campaign teams who uh, know what they're doing and who we know will actually put to use what it is they paid us to do. So if we've got great stuff and the camp, that candidate you know, just wants to stay positive and it's not working, uh, that is a frustrating position to be in. So... A candidate who wants to be the campaign manager and not the candidate is not a spot we want to be in. Uh, they can't have both jobs. And no. they're, pay they're paying a team of professionals uh, so that they can be the candidate and not the campaign manager. Yeah, I've, I've seen far too many folks, both good and bad, fall into that trap. People who can put our stuff to work uh, you know, from a media and a messaging standpoint uh, is great to see. Um, and like I said before, most of the time they can just take the wording right out of the report because we've written mail, we've written TV, uh, we've done all that, and that's why why it pays to get you know actual political operatives doing your opposition research. Well, and you guys have the general consulting experience and the strategic experience to understand the importance of what you find and how that gets communicated. You and Mark and the rest of your team have you're not just researchers with your pocket protectors and your green visored hat. Your guys actually have been out in the field and did this. Right. I mean, Mark will never tell a client, you know, there's nothing there. We've looked and there's nothing there. You can always create a narrative out of surprisingly little. Everybody's got one. I mean, there, there's, yeah, there's information about you or I or anybody else out there that there's a narrative to be created. You know, it doesn't take lying. I think a lot of people will think that there's something where you know, opposite research you make up stuff or, or create stuff where there's not there. That's not your job. Your job is not to, to create lies or try to dig up and make up stuff. This is about finding things that are actually there and how does that how is that explained? How do you how does your campaign explain it or the other team that you're going up against? Right. And I mean if we're researching someone and there's very little there, that that's the narrative. That's the report. Who is this person? Can we trust them? They haven't given any money to anybody. Do we know where they stand? Yeah. Have they voted? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The number of people, I have not, uh, I am by no means, uh, I, I don't do opposition research because uh, the stuff that I do cannot be classified as such. But you know, just simple you know, searches that I've done, it's surprising how many people, there is very little out there. There is no donor history. There is very little voting history. The number of people that I've seen try to run for a municipal office that haven't ever voted a municipal election it's crazy. Yeah. And they deserve to be asked about that. You care enough to think that you're going to be important on the city council, but yet you've never voted for the mayor. Right. Really. 
<sighs> uh, just, I mean, it, it issues like like that, like not voting, they go all the way up to people running for government. You wouldn't think it did, but that's that's part of why you know, some of these things don't classify as, as what will be the top of the deck of questions you might research if you're doing this yourself. But that's part of why exhaustive research is so critical because sometimes you find stuff that you couldn't imagine would actually be there. You see somebody that seems pretty squared away, a solid candidate, and then all of a sudden you start doing research like, wow, this person left some pretty big stuff hanging out there. They, they've, oh, yeah. got the, they've got the tax liens. They've got the domestic you know, violence con, you know, uh, you know, charges. These things that you wouldn't expect looking at this person on stage, but all of a sudden you're like, holy crap, this, this is legit. I can't tell you how many times I've had this same conversation. Oh, this person's been in elected office for 20 years. If there's anything, it's already out there. Oh. No, not true. If they've been there for 20 years, they probably haven't had a real race in 18. So yep. no one's looking. Well, and Sony, there's so many examples out there of people that the, the real dirt on them came after they got elected. The things yeah. that, that, I mean, they started doing shady stuff, you know, a cycle or two in or campaign or two into their, uh, their time as an elected official. Well, I've, yeah. We've seen multiple examples of that here in Texas in the last couple of years. When they had the means, motive, and opportunity. Yep. Great things happen. <laughs> All right. So so we've done a pretty good job, I think, of scaring folks out of running for office. <laughs> so let's let's kind of circle back to talking about what they what they should do. So all right, John, I'm thinking about running for state rep or state senate. Um, you know, what advice do you have for me, other than obviously hiring intels to, to do my, my research? What advice, what are the things I can be doing now, whether I'm wanting to run this cycle or, or down the line, to help shore up my campaign and my candidacy? Uh, step one, as with all life decisions, talk to your spouse and see if they'll talk you out of it. I'm always a big fan of making sure the spouse is on board. And if they, hey, this is, this, that's literally the first question I ask any campaign I'm working with is, is your spouse on board? And when they say yes, I'm like, is she or he really on board? Because this is not just a you decision. It's not just your ego. They have to be your biggest, most convicted fan. Uh, every, every campaign needs to be a family affair because uh, you're going to be at a fundraiser every night. And that, that weighs hard on everyone. So. Um, uh, definitely important to do a vulnerability study. Um, and it cannot be candidate led. Uh, it needs, it needs to be true opposition research on yourself. Uh, that's the only way it can work. So, um, a lot of times, um, somebody close to the candidate who, uh, maybe has knowledge of all, all their business dealings and, and personal history, um, will work with us on a vulnerability study, um, giving us selected information uh, directed by the candidate in order to paint a certain picture. And we know what's missing and you're not fooling us or helping your own campaign. Um, you need to be honest with yourself. And, and that's not just part of opposition research, but that's just part of running for office is you need to be honest with yourself. You know, why are you doing this? Um, you're, you can't hide what's happened, um, but you just need to be truthful with the voters. And lying is uh, is never a good way to go. Messaging and lying are different things. You can improve messaging. Yeah, it's far too many people I've seen uh, when they're dealing with those in-house folks, whether it's a true opposition research or just working with a smaller team on on a local level, they. They try to hold up that. They try to keep up that veneer that they have on stage. And the fact is that if you're helping me run for office, uh, I've got to be open. I've got to be 100% honest because you can't help me unless I'm totally transparent. It's better that you know everything. That the small thing, this you know, the the, the time that I got too many speeding tickets or the time that I did whatever, um, the time I was late on my taxes, you should know all of that because you can help me understand how big of a deal is that? Right. You know, is that important? How do I deal with that? How do I explain that? Uh, is it, you know, if, if you're talking about a bunch of stuff like the guy that, uh, the, the, the pizza delivery guy, is this somewhere I should consider not running? Is, I mean, because right. there, there are those times where you're like, maybe this disqualifies me, or maybe even if I still think I'm the right guy, maybe this is not worth what it's going to do to my marriage or my family or my business reputation or my job. You, know, you have to think about that. 
Yeah, and if if we're doing the opposition research and uh, we find that our opponent was late on his taxes, we better have done the vulnerability study where our own guy was late on his taxes, because that's that's an important contrast to avoid. Yeah, you don't want to be the guy that starts going out there. Oh yeah, so and so was late on their taxes three times, and you're like, oh, actually, our guy was late five times. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I know there are plenty of times. I mean, so many of these things. I know I look at these national campaigns where the, you know these things come out and are in the news everywhere, right? And it, it still boggles my mind that people don't do this. I mean, is this becoming more common on the, you know, is, is in, as you guys are doing this, I know there are other vendors out there that obviously do a much worse job. What, I mean, is opposition research and higher level stuff becoming a more common thing across the board? Or kind of where's the state of that market? Um, I, it, I think it is growing, um, and obviously we've been growing um, the last few years, but people see so much trash out there in the news and wonder how they figure this out, and they get scared. Um, so, you know, they want to know what's out there and what you can find uh, on, on your own side but they also want to take advantage of those skills in looking at the opponent. So, How do you think that is uh, that voters' attitudes toward a lot of this opposition research is changing? Because, I mean, we're, we're the Facebook generation, right? We're, we're, gonna be the, we're seeing the first generation of candidates that have had a Facebook for, you know, since high school. And God knows the stuff that's out there on most of these people. Uh, we recently, there was recently a guy who was running for, I think, state rep or state senate in Alabama that a picture of him at a church function that he went as Tiger Woods like when Tiger Woods in his prime and he was in blackface like face wow. painted with shoe polish and he got I, I think he actually may still be in the race but he's in the process of being drummed out reputation killed uh, because you know I don't know whether the guy's a bad guy or racist or not but he made a very very bad decision and then a decade or so later he's running for state senate I mean are people's attitudes changing towards some of this as we get in the Facebook generation or do you think we're going to see some of these things continue to matter in a big way. Uh, well, I think there is a difference between you know something that goes viral, and uh, you know you and I might look at it, and this is a faraway candidate, and uh, we are not voting in that election, and we might dismiss it as just you know another politician being stupid. Um, but I think what it comes down to ultimately uh, is how the actual voters. Uh, perceive you and trust you and you know if they're willing to let that go uh, if they know enough about you before that comes out to know that that's not the real you then there's a chance but if if it comes at the point where uh, that bad thing is defining you uh, then there's a real problem when voters go to vote they're going to remember one or two things about you and one or two things about your opponent if it's the one or two things you want them to know, you win. If it's the one or two things they want the voter to know, you lose. So when you're piling up the mountain of uh, bad info, uh, your pile needs to be smaller than the opponent's pile. And that's an election. Well, and that comes down <laughs> to, to why it's important that, that you communicate those things the right way, right? Because it's not just the size of the pile. It's how how specific, concise, and well communicated those points are. Because if I'm, I like to think about it in terms of, hey, if I'm explaining to my wife why she should vote for this person, my wife's a wonderful woman and very conservative, but her attention span, and when I start talking about politics, <laughs> that attention span spans shrinks you know, dramatically. So I need to be able to communicate the why in a very succinct form. And most voters don't have, they don't want to listen to 15 or 20 minutes. They need a few nuggets. And, yeah. and the work that you guys do to present that in the way that voters actually care about is absolutely critical. Yeah, you are not being fair to the voters if you uh, tell them that something is important and then explain it in a very complicated way. They don't have time. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes down to how it influences, like I said, what they think of you as a person. And I've always, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm right, but I've always thought that it is a lot more important that a voter like you as a candidate than agree with everything you have to say. They need to like you as a person and like the idea of you being their guy or their woman, their person out there representing them. And I'm, Go ahead. I might be breaking your rules here, but I'm going to talk directly to the listeners. And go for you. it. 
no one is reading your white paper on whatever policy you want to talk about on your website. They want to vo voters want to vote for someone who is like them, with whom they share values, who is smarter than them, but doesn't act like it. That's kind of it. Yeah. Okay. I like that. They, they're, they're not reading all your issue pages. They just want to know where your head's at. John is speaking truth, guys. Listen, <laughs> listen up. I'm not taking credit for that. Mark Campbell says it every day to everyone he talks to. And he's been doing this for 35 years. And I don't think that that part, the essence of politics and a campaign has changed much or will anytime soon. No, that's, that's going to, I think that's been true as long as there have been campaigns and will continue to be true. And uh, yeah, we're going to get, we're going to get Mark on here very soon to, to talk some more about the cruise campaign and what you guys do and, and kind of the GC side. Now, before we, that was the last thing we're talking about. I think this is probably, you probably have some examples you can share and some we'll have to talk about over drinks and cigars offline, but uh, let's wrap up by talking about some of your favorite fail stories. Uh, whether it's stuff that you've seen in the media, we'll, we'll just let you just kind of give it broad. You don't have to tell us whether you <laughs> you've read it on uh, on Politico, whether you actually work with these guys, or seen them on your campaigns. What, what are some of your favorite fail stories? Uh, can we talk about the DNC leak? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, well, first of all, I had nothing to do with that. Uh, Allegedly, but I did enjoy watching it, and it gets to such a fundamental. Uh, it. You want to talk about opposition research? You can't change the fact that you did it. You know it's coming, going to come out. So you look at the DNC emails, and you know their response is not that we didn't mean that or uh, it was misinterpreted. Just that we didn't think anyone would ever see it. <laughs> yeah. How, how is that reality? Oh, that's. That's the DNC. I, and apparently a lot of people didn't care. A lot of people bought it, which boggled my mind even more. I don't know sometimes. Yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of things that, uh, especially working in politics full time, you look at as like, man, my faith is rattled. <laughs> yeah. There is, uh, there's plenty to, to rattle you in, in this kind of world where you see things, you're like, how can people not care? And <laughs> you will find a large portion of people that don't actually care. All right, John, well, I can't thank you enough for coming on today. This has been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed this, and I'm sure our listeners will as well. Where can they find you online, and uh, how can they reach out if they need to hire somebody to do some, do some good research? Well, thanks, Raz. I uh, appreciate you having me on, and uh, it was good to tell, tell listeners a little bit more about uh, what an opposition researcher does, and hopefully they understood why we're a little bit, a bit better at it than other people. Uh, you can find us at intels.com, I-N-T-E-L-L-Z. And if you're wondering what the rationale is behind the name, it was short and the domain was available. <laughs> I am about the worst person in the world at naming things, and I have great appreciation for that. <laughs> I have named things on less. Unfortunately, the Internet has been around for quite a while, so most of the domain names are taken. Very, very good. All right, well, guys, uh, thank you, John, for joining us today and our sponsor, Campaign Sidekick. Check out the show notes for John's content information. We'll have links to his Twitter and intels and all the rest of the stuff there, as well as the snippets from the show. Y'all take care. Thank you, Raz. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.